So today we're going to be finishing up chapter 13 and, uh, and get at least part of the way into chapter 14. Um, before we do that, does anybody have any shalom moments to share that from this week? Well, I think I can share the little shalom moment with uh, Carolyn Lighty and the breakfast group. <laughs> um, as you know, there's always a group that goes for breakfast at the, at the trolley station. And uh, John and I happened to be there with Izzy. And it was nice just to have a breakfast with her in the morning and catch up with her what she was doing. So I get a note and, um, you know, there was about 10 of them that were there and someone paid for everyone's breakfast and in that group. And Carolyn sent a note. She said she sent it to pastor first. And then she went on to me. She said, we just, you know, wanted to thank whoever that person is. But she said, I told pastor that I'm going to take what the cost of my breakfast is and put it in the offering plate. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought that that was really a nice gesture. Good shalom moment. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Absolutely. Well, on that same line, um, Last weekend, Larry and I went to Lancaster to spend the weekend with our friend down there. And before we went to her house, we thought we would grab some lunch and we went to the Cracker Barrel that's down there. And we were sitting there and we had already placed our order and there was two uh, young men, maybe in their 20s, uh, sitting at a table uh, a ways from us. And there was two senior aged women that were sitting across from them. And the waitress had both of the same tables uh, and uh, the young men had ordered uh, and then the uh, senior ladies. And um, all of a sudden, uh, there was like a little commotion over there. And I looked and um, the waitress was at the senior ladies, ladies table and then she had gone to the young gentleman's table and the ladies were picking up the ticket for the young men's uh, lunch, which I thought was really nice. And then they all put their glasses in the air and toasted each other um, oh, that day. Nice. And when the young men left, they again went to her table and thanked her profusely you know, for buying them their lunch. But the look on their face when the waitress told them that their lunch was being paid for by the by the ladies was was just priceless. It was it was um, it's first time I ever saw anything like that. And it was just fantastic. It was and even, you know, I, I, we didn't do it, but it, it gives you a kind of a, a nice feeling, you know, that there are there are good things happening and, um, you know, you don't realize it all the time. Um, I didn't have a shalom moment, but I feel like we provided um, a shalom moment for someone else. So Sherry Hawk sent me this text on Sunday, so I'll read it to you guys. Um, it says, I was going to stop in coffee hour to say um, with the pastor's sermon, um, but she said, you were smiling at mom. I think she means like during the service. Tina was waving um, to her. Mary, um, uh, I think she means Mary Hendershot. Mary Hendershot was rubbing her shoulders. Yesterday, Carolyn called to see how we were doing. You greeted us with a big smile this morning. The greeters were so nice. I cried. I couldn't sing for a couple minutes. I know, I know I would have tried to tell you this in person, um, but I would have cried. I'm starting to now. I really felt loved everyone just is so nice to me and mom and i feel so blessed thank you um so i thought that was really nice that she she felt loved and felt that the congregation like loves her mom and um sometimes it made me think that sometimes you really don't know who you affect just by smiling at someone and um mm -hmm. So I thought maybe it would be nice if, if other people knew that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I'm having a shalom moment now, just thinking about how blessed I am to, you know, to, 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 to be in this congregation, you know, with people who, you know, this is, I, I, I had heard both those stories earlier this week from, you know, from somebody else. And um, it's just, uh, you know, instead of dealing with, you know, the kind of uh, stuff that goes on in some congregations, it's nice to, to, to hear about all this stuff. So. Mm -hmm. All right, anybody else? Then let's pray. Yeah, we thank you for all the opportunities this past week to see your, your love and your shalom in action. We thank you for, um, for the chance to, uh, to receive this peace and this grace and for the chance to share it. Uh, as we uh, continue to study your word today, bless us with, with further signs of, of your grace and your peace. Amen. Amen. All right, we are going to start on page 66. Um, I actually want to read through the whole page before we talk about it. Um, so maybe uh, we could just uh, start going around and, and each person read one paragraph till we're, we're done with the page. And the order I see on my screen is Brenda, June, Georgia, Mary, Karen, Joe, and Kim. So, uh, so Brenda, you can start and we'll just, we'll just go around and read a paragraph at a time and we'll talk about it at the end. The passionate lover God was thrilled. Could a human family actually practice what life is all about? Friendship with God, with others, and with nature? Could this people join Jesus in becoming the first fruits of a restored creation? June. One group did not share the joy of God, the big deals, the religious and government leaders. They were extremely upset. Just when the thought, when they thought things were back to normal, this Jesus movement was spreading over the Roman Empire. A new way of believing and living was threatening their well-organized world of rewards, status, hierarchy, points distinctions, enemies, oppression, and manna for some, mercy for some. They used reason, speeches, threats, ridicule, arrest, economic sanctions, imprisonment, torture, and death to try and stop the Jesus movement. They failed, however, because the partner people were not afraid. They were secure in the loving arms of God who held them in life and in death. Even the threat of execution did not deter them. They were free, totally free. Liberated from fear, the followers of the way refused when the big deals ordered them to stop teaching and living as Jesus's man of people. The believers replied, we must obey God rather than humans. This infuriated the big deal to were convinced that they were speaking for God. When punishment came, the believers responded with a form of power which the rulers did not understand, the power of forgiveness, mercy, and love. They followed the example of Jesus and of Stephen, the first martyr, who forgave those who were stoning him to death. Okay. What strikes you reading this page? Is that, did anything uh, jump out at you before we get to some of the questions I have? They didn't like the um, the big deals. Didn't like the fact that Jesus was leveling the playing field so that everyone was equal, and they wanted to be more important. <laughs> so it was threatening to them. Yeah. Her partner people were not afraid. Yeah. Secure God's arm, loving arms. Yeah. Yeah, I want to talk about that a little bit more after, um, see if anybody else says anything that, that jumped out at you. And they, and, you know, also in that paragraph, they were free, totally free, that they really, you know, felt that freedom 
even under the, you know, everything that was happening. So where do you think that came from? That 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 um, that sense of not being afraid, that sense of being free, and and you know from from a you know from a purely objective standpoint, they you know, they weren't any more free than they were you know a year earlier. They were just, um, but they experienced freedom. Um, what what do you think that was about? Where did that come from? That that lack of fear, that feeling that that they were <laughs> free. Oh God. Okay. Because it says they felt secure in God's loving arms. So they, and that they, would, they, oh, go ahead. Yeah. And that would give them freedom. So they had, they, they had the security. Feeling. They had, they had faith. Mm -hmm. yeah. What else? Where, where else could they have gotten this from, do you think? from the people around them that believed like they did? Yeah, the fact that they were a community who supported one another in this. Um... Partner people. Mm. Yeah, partnering with God and with one another, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think maybe part of it also was that that they, you know, with their experience with Jesus and seeing that 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 for Jesus suffering was not um, was not the end and and was actually um, you know he 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 was a partner with them in their suffering so they knew that it, that they could still be free even if they were suffering. What are you seeing these pictures? Take a look at the, the, the big picture on the left there. What's going on there? The Pharaoh's saying they must stop it. Stop it now. Yeah, you called him the Pharaoh, and that 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 fits a lot with the way we, we've been describing that the big deals were living Pharaoh's Egypt lifestyle. Um, you know, who do you think that that uh, that that really would be? And I have to look that up. Actually, there's a reference here to Acts five. The religious and government leaders. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm guessing it's one of them. Yeah, I'm gonna see if it's one 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 person in particular who's mentioned here in Acts five. It. Uh, I don't know. Would it be like a Roman leader or? That's a good guess. It says the the high priest is mentioned in that in that section. So I guess that's supposed to be the high priest. Though he does have a little crown on. So. Yeah. Uh, but either he's probably kind of an amalgamation. He's supposed to represent the Romans and the high priests and, and in a sense, Pharaoh. Yeah. And what are the people doing there? Just standing together and, and um, not paying any attention to him. <laughs> <laughs> We're following God. We're obeying him. <laughs> yeah. I like their timeline. He needs to lighten up. <laughs> <laughs> it looks so calm, don't they? they you know, it, yeah. The way, the way the picture is drawn, I, I almost can see this 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 king figure just like kind of beating them, you know, smashing them into you know little, little right. pieces. But you know, they're 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 okay. They're okay. They know that they're going to be okay. And what's going on in the in the bottom picture then? Yeah, 
that where they were stoning Stephen? Mm -hmm. I think that's supposed to be Stephen them. there. But I'm sorry, what? He's forgiving them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I guess he's asking God also to forgive them. Yeah. And he's doing what, you know, what Jesus did from the cross. You know, Jesus, um, you know, asked God to forgive them. And, uh, and he's saying the same thing here. And there's a little hidden thing in this picture. There, there's, there's a guy in the background there who uh, I, I'm pretty sure is supposed to be one person in particular. Does anybody have a guess who that person is in the background? At Paul? I think so. Um, Acts tells us when, when Stephen was stoned um, that there, there was a Pharisee um, named Saul who was holding their cloaks as they did so. Ah, the cloaks. Yeah. I was wondering what that was he was holding. I thought it might have been some type of grain or like sheaths or something like that. Mm -hmm. But that hurts. Yeah, I wouldn't guess that that was, was cloaks either, except that in that story, that's what it says mm -hmm. that, that he was doing. Um, and of course... You know, a few chapters later, Saul shows up again and, and has his conversion experience and gets renamed Paul. Um, and again, what, what does Stephen's face look like here? Is he's, you know, is he, he, he knows his death is just about coming. Um, Peaceful, calm. Yeah. So what, what these people were doing through their actions, through their, their, their attitudes, you know, even in the face of, of this persecution, you know, as they were bearing witness to, to God's reign, they were saying that, you know, I, I'm following God because God is more powerful than, than anything you can throw at me. Even if what you throw at me kills me, I, it, God is still more powerful than that. Um, how do, you, how do you or how do we bear witness to the future reign of God in our lives? We probably don't experience this kind of persecution. I, that we don't. But, um, but how, do you, how do you do that in your life? Or how have you seen people do that? I pray about it sometimes because it's such an overwhelming um, situation. Mm -hmm. uh, I try to even pray while, I, while it's happening, but I learned from my experience and say, how could I have dealt with that differently without getting, you know, riled up? Just I, my favorite word lately, and I told Pastor, I think it was last year, <laughs> was equanimity, and that is to face anything uh, with calmness and uh, with uh, love and wisdom um, so that's hard to do when you when your emotions kick in and your ego <laughs> so I try to do that so it's hard I think we began today hearing stories of a couple ways that's done hmm you know, the simple acts of kindness and, and smiling and, um, you know, um, smile can go a long way. A kind word. Maybe What's by listening. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say maybe by listening more. Mm -hmm. Instead of trying to, you know, kind of discern and, you know, like Karen was saying and praying, you know, intercessing, not only that, you know, we're asking for the way we should see it should be, but, you know, listening and, you know, how it's affecting all of those that are in that part to intercess, you know, not criticize, but, you know, move. And that, that takes a lot. Yeah. what do you think would happen if the church today were outlawed 
or were was 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 treated um you know with with this level of violence from um from those in power what, what do you think would happen i think people would meet secretly maybe yeah. a lot of people just would not you know, be part of the church out of fear. Mm -hmm. Some people would fall away, certainly. Yeah. I agree. I, I don't think people now have the same fortitude that people had in the early church days. Like, I don't know if, I don't know, like, I don't even know if I myself would put up with being killed or you know, over my faith. I would hope that I could, but I, I don't know. I don't know if, if I feel like my faith is as strong as some of the, as Stephen and some of the early Christians. Um, I, I, I look what happened with the pandemic. Like I could completely understand why people weren't in church for the first year, but now we're like two years later and there's still people that aren't back at church and maybe some of those people are fearful, but I think a lot of people are just, yep, eh, they're out of the habit. Like I haven't been to church for two years. What's the, I'm not, I'm not really interested in going to church, my own kids included. So, you know, they, they're just not interested. So if you add, but then there's probably a small amount of people that if it's outlawed, that's enough to make them want to do it because they just want to be rebels <laughs> yeah. and they just want to do something that's outlawed, you know, but I think I think most most people would just be like, no, I'm afraid I don't want to go. And maybe they didn't have a big enough commitment to begin with. But I'm not saying that would be everybody. I agree. There's probably some people that would meet in secret, but I, I don't know. I don't think it would be the same as what happened with the early Christians. I know from living in China that there was, like Mary said, meetings secretly. There are a lot of home type of, you know, meetings where, you know, where people are meeting in secret because in China, you know, the, the church was open, but we had to show a passport to get in. The church was open for non-Chinese people. Oh, interesting. Oh. Wow. Was it even in Hong Kong? No, Hong Kong was Hong different. Kong. Okay. Yep. Hong Kong was different. I don't know how it is today. Yeah. But in China, it was, you know, we would, you know, we went and the one church building was used all throughout the day. Like, uh, you know, there were uh, Koreans that used, you know, had a big group and they met in the evening and, you know, different, different ways like that. So it was kind of like one building was used for many services, you know, during the day. But that, you know, the young, I worked with mainly a lot of younger people that were all, you know, in 20 and 30 years old. And many of the, you know, the young girls would wear a cross and that would give me an opportunity to, you know, to talk with them. And they said, you know, we really can't, you know, yes, I do. But, you know, let's not, when we talk, let's not talk around anyone else because we don't know. Maybe what we discover is, you know, who, who is committed and who isn't, um, you know. I've sometimes wondered that about, um, you know, the difference between the, uh, you know, the huge number of people who came, who would attend worship in, you know, in the 1940s and 50s compared to the numbers today. I've wondered if, um, you know, at a time when it was just culturally expected that you attended worship, and at a time when there literally was nothing else you could do on a Sunday morning but attend worship, you know, maybe there were a lot of people who weren't all that committed, but who came for, you know, for other reasons, for, you know, convenience or, or to be seen or something. And I wonder if maybe today we have just as many committed people as we did then. It's just we don't have, we don't have a lot of the cultural people the way we did. I, I don't know if that's true, but that's a speculation I've often had. Um, 
Thank but on you, the other right? hand, maybe sometimes you don't realize how important something is to you until it's threatened to take away. Like, so, you know, maybe like I sometimes wonder, you know, whether I would be willing to die for my faith, but I don't feel like I'm in a position where somebody's asking me right now to die for my faith or, or forbidding me to attend worship. But when you're put in that situation where something then is forbidden, then you realize how important it actually is to you that, oh, wait, now somebody's telling me I can't do this. And then it almost become, it could become more important to you when you're at risk of not being able to to have it or at risk not being able to participate in that. So it's interesting questions. You know, it's, it's not a problem I hope we ever have, but, um, but uh, you know, I think you're right that we, we don't know how much faith we have until it's tested. Um, and, um, you know, hopefully our faith won't be tested that way, but, but if it is, we'll find out. All right, we're going to jump forward a couple decades. Um, chapter 13 took place like right after the resurrection, you know, just within the first, you know, year or two, more or less. Um, chapter 14 uh, is, uh, is a couple decades later and is mostly a snapshot of what the church looked like in the middle of the first century. Um, and we're particularly going to be looking at the church in Corinth, probably around the year 60. And the reason for that is because um, we have some record of, of some things in the church of Corinth because of the letters that Paul wrote to them. Um, so Corinth was a, was a pretty large and cosmopolitan city, um, and it, it seems like Paul himself had established a church there sometime around the year 50. Um, so, uh, but, but most of what we know about, about you know, the Church of Corinth, in fact, pretty much everything we know about the Church of Corinth comes from, um, from the letters that, that, that Paul wrote probably about 10 years later. So let's, um, let's start on page 67. We'll read just the first paragraph. Okay, uh, next, I think. Um, the danger of, of Pharaoh's Egypt way. While a community of faith resisted the violent attacks from the outside, they also faced an inside threat, accommodation. The process of slowly adopting the ways of the Pharaoh's Egypt world. When this began to happen, the Holy Spirit raised up teachers to call the partner people back to their mission, to live as God's contrast society. An outstanding teacher was Paul, a Jewish rabbi who followed Jesus. Okay. We talked a little bit about Paul in the picture on the last page. Um, what, what do you know about Paul? What, what, um, what, what have you learned about Paul over the years? What do you know about him? He was a Roman citizen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yep. He was imprisoned. A lot. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. And he wrote a lot of letters. He liked to write. He did. He did. Yeah. But he also traveled to these other um, countries, didn't he? Yes, in fact, in in, uh, in in some in some Bibles, if you turn to the back where there's maps, um, so often one of the maps is like uh, you know Paul's travels, and it'll have you know big arrows all over it as he went all around the you know pretty much the known I'm reading, world. I'm reading Acts now, and um, you know he goes to Asia, he goes yeah. to he's going all well over. Yeah. Uh -huh. What else do we know about Paul? Was he married? I don't think so. I don't think it says one way or the other, but it certainly doesn't sound like he's married. Yeah. Um, 
Well, if he was, he, he left his wife behind. That's I for guess sure. so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know that anybody could handle living with him. <laughs> <laughs> he was pretty high strung. He was a pretty high strung guy, it seems. He also had um, one, one thing that that often strikes me about Paul is he, he had some sort of problem in his life um, that he referred to as his thorn. He said that, that, that he has this thorn that, um, that he prayed that God would take away um, and God never did. And, and over the years, people have kind of guessed what that might be. There, you know, there, there's been a, um, a thought that Paul had epilepsy and that he would have seizures from time to time. And that was the thorn that, that, that needed to be taken away. Some people have suggested he had um, some kind of severe depression or something like that. It's, it's not really clear what the thorn was, but it was something that, that, um, that he came to believe um, made him even stronger that, that he was um, that, that he was strong because of his own weakness that, 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 that made him rely more on God. And he, um, and most of the New Testament is attributed to Paul, you know, um, other than the, um, you know, the Gospels and Revelation and the Book of Acts, most of the New Testament is letters, and the vast majority of those letters are attributed to Paul. Now, it, it's quite possible and even likely that some of those letters were, um, were kind of written after Paul's time and were, um, were written in his name, which was, was a common thing at the time. It would have been people who kind of followed his... Uh, uh, you know, his school, but, um, but was, they were not technically written by him, but, but certainly a lot of them were written by him. So Paul has done a lot, Paul did a lot to kind of, you know, draw out what, what the initial theology of the church was and, and figure out what, um, you know, what it is to believe in, in Jesus and, and, and where we are. Um, all right, so let, let's, um, let's read through the rest of the page then. The whole page? Uh, yes. The community of Jesus started to practice accommodation by the way they shared the Lord's Supper. Following the style of the Roman Empire, the rich were eating and drinking too much while the poor did not have enough. Paul pleaded with them to repent, saying, if you eat and drink without discerning the body, you eat and drink damnation upon yourselves. The Corinthian Christians failed to discern the body by their practice of eating and drinking without regard for the poor in the congregation, a part of the body of Christ. Paul told them that such a practice was actually causing some to get sick and some to die, the rot of hoarded manna. Paul called the Corinthian believers back to the tradition, the meal is a participation in Christ to live the life of manna for all and mercy for all. Okay. So what we see in the picture here is, um, is a picture of what it looks like the Corinthians were doing that Paul was telling them to stop doing. And what, what, do, you, what do you see here in the picture? Some have too much and some didn't have any. Yeah, and, and who, who was, uh, that's what I was gonna ask. What was that, June? Yes, I was saying something similar to Mary, that rich people are on the left and the poor people on the right here. Yep. So the, 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 the rich have lots to eat and the poor don't have much to eat at all. It's almost like they're having a brown bag communion. Like, you know, bring what you have for communion and... Um, those who have a lot brought a lot, and those who had a little brought a little. <clears throat> and what is, um, you know, the leader here? What is what is what is interesting about what he's saying here? His arms are outstretched, including all. He's including all. Does, does this sound like something that, that, that you'd hear a pastor say today? When we eat and drink, we share the body and blood of Christ. Come to the tables of the Lord. Oh. You notice that S in the brackets there. I think that's, mm -hmm. to me, that, that, that's the very telling thing. You know, when we, when we share communion, we, we say it's one table. We, um, right. Mm-hmm. And part of the reason we do that is because, you know, Paul wrote down that we should do that <laughs> and we, we learn from Paul. 
Um, so Paul uses uh, the word body a lot in his writings, and we see we see you know body showing up here um, in this page in a couple ways, and I th I think. I think we see him using body in in at least three different ways. What what do you um what do you to pick up on? What what's one of those ways that he uses the word body? Discerning the body, he says that once. Yeah, and what do you think that is when he says discerning the body? If we talk about the body of Christ, what might he be referring to? It's um, that the body of Christ, they don't see the body of Christ within them. They see God's body outside of them. Okay, so that's part of it is but Paul Paul talked a lot about how we are the body of Christ. How, how um, you know, he said, you know, we are the body of Christ and individually members of it. it Paul had this one um uh thing he would he said in a couple of letters about how you know we're all members of the body or parts of the body. So that's that's one meaning of body that that it's the community. What else? Uh. In, in the picture, it doesn't appear that the rich thought the poor were part of the body. Of mm. Mm -hmm. The reminder that 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 we're all part of the body, not just those who have. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it means anything, but nobody's actually eating. They're all just standing there. I'm like, <laughs> that's an interesting uh, point. Yeah, I'm not sure whether Ellender means anything by that, but yeah. And so, so maybe they didn't they they didn't recognize that that you know what is this food? This food is the body. The body of Christ. That's another definition of body of Christ that comes from Paul. That 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 you know um, that the body of Christ both means the bread of communion and means the community itself. So when Paul says, you know, if you eat and drink without discerning the body, without recognizing this food is not just food. This food is the body of Christ. You don't get it. And if you eat without discerning the whole body, how you're all one together, you don't get it. And I think the other thing he's talking about with the, with the body is, you know, where it says at the end that, that, that this practice caused some people to get sick and die. I think Paul was concerned with, with the literal body, you know, with um, the fact that, you know, in, you know, those on the right here may have died of starvation because they didn't have enough. Those on the left might have died, you know, of, of gluttony um, because they, they were, were, were too focused on you know, on, on, on gorging themselves. So I think, um, you know, the word, the word body in Paul has, 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 you know, a lot of different meanings like that. What are some ways that, that our church, um, and you can think of our own congregation or the church in general, whatever, wherever you want to define that, what are some ways that our church today respects and honors actual human bodies? Food pantry. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we try and take care of people's bo people's bodies out in the community, yeah. don't we? And, and, and while you were talking, what was going through my head was, I, and I'm sure most of the people that visit the food pantries probably do have a church. They probably do visit a church, but maybe some of them don't. And wouldn't it be nice if we could somehow offer them communion in some way? Ooh. That's it. <laughs> intriguing idea yeah it was going through my head while you were talking hmm. i can't immediately figure out what that would look like but it's a neat, I, you neat know, idea even, to think about. even to set up something at a pump huh. on a monday when they visit you know for those who would like to receive maybe you could go and some of us could go with you and 
because uh, since we have the cups now, there's really, you know, there's no touching, there's no, uh, you know, it, it's, it's individual. The cups are individual. I don't know, it's just something that maybe we could offer. Yeah, it raises some questions. Uh, one of which, do we then ask these people, are you baptized? Have you received uh, first communion uh, instruction? Do you believe in the real presence of Christ? Um, do you really appreciate what this is all about? So the church has a lot of rules about communion, yeah, yeah. which I'm not sure are very bright, but anyhow, <laughs> you know, I sometimes think of Eastern Orthodoxy and how they get it right and how they get it wrong. In the Eastern Orthodox Church, when you're baptized, you get communion. They spoon the wine into the child, into the baby's mouth, which I think is right. But then on the other hand, they say, if you're not of the Eastern Orthodox faith, you can't get communion here. So, you know, the, the, you know, the, the church, you know, in its various manifestations, sometimes gets it right and sometimes gets it wrong. Um, I did, did not receive communion when I was confirmed. Then the age was dropped to fifth grade, then the second grade. And as far as I'm concerned, you should go to baptize. And sometimes I'm wondering if we even get too hung up on that. Um, so yeah, if you're going to start doing a public communion like that, you got to answer all those questions, and I and, and that's that gets kind of iffy. Well, I've been wrong then because I have not asked those questions when I have been visiting people in the past in the nursing home when their neighbor or someone came in in a wheelchair. And, and was really interested that I was doing. And I, I said, well, what church do you go to? And, and the man said, the Moravian church. And, and I said, would you like to receive communion <laughs> with your friend? And he did. So he was a practicing Moravian. And I didn't ask him, are you, you know, confirmed? Are you this or that? I just. What, what, if, what if the person had been a Hindu or a Muslim and wanted communion? What would you have done? I would have hesitated um, because it, it does not, the, the liturgy does not follow their, their belief system. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, we, we get visitors in our church and uh, they may go up for communion. We don't ask at that time yeah. if they're baptized Christians. Yeah. You know, we take it upon faith that they are. And, and you know, that's between them and the Lord. Believe it or yeah, not, there's a study. So I, I, I'm sorry, I threw a uh, monkey wrench into. No, I think it's no. a wonderful monkey wrench. It's a I good monkey wrench because wrench. it brings up good, important questions. Believe it or not, the the, the ELCA is is kind of doing a, a you know, undergoing a study right now to talk about, you know, where are the lines for communion and 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 should there be any at all? You know, what what do we do when when someone comes in the door who um, no, may um, not be I baptized? When my mother died, we had the uh, the mass at, in a Catholic church, and um, I know I'm excommunicated from that church because of my divorce. But I I went up and I received communion anyway, and and I think the Lord forgave me. I shouldn't have, according to their rules, but it was between me and the Lord. I I you know I felt at that point, and I did it more for my mother. But, you know, but those, those rules, and, and I think, you know, it's important to note that, you know, that we all have rules. You know, sometimes we, we, you know, we, we like to beat our chest and say that we're, you know, we're, we're better because we allow anyone to share communion. But when you get down to it, you know, it's, well, if you're oh, baptized yeah. and yeah. you've received your yeah. first communion. And, and um, the most importantly is the Catholics believe you have to go to confession before you, and I never went to confession. Right. Wow. So, um you know, I, th I think this, this, you know, story from first Corinthians that, that, that we see here, you know, reminds us that, that all these rules are things we gotta, we gotta pay attention to because we might be doing what, what they did here. Um, we might not be, but it, it's, um, yeah, it's, it, these are good questions. You know, my, my, my usual thing is, you know, I, I'll err on the side of, of grace. If, if somebody comes for communion, I will give them communion. Um, am I 
technically following what I'm supposed to be doing as an ordained person in the, the ELCA? Not necessarily, but um, but that's that's the way I, I come down. And, uh, and I agree with you. I think you should. It, it's interesting that when, when Archbishop Tutu and the Dalai Lama had their last visit, Archbishop Tutu and the Dalai Lama were very close friends. It was a very close friendship over the course of time. And the last time they were together was a few years ago. Um, and in the course of that visit, they decided to share with one another kind of the most intimate manifestations of their faith. So the Dalai Lama led Archbishop Tutu and his daughter through some kind of Hindu ritual or, or Buddhist ritual, I guess it is. I don't understand it all. But the Archbishop also gave communion to the Dalai Lama. And the Dalai Lama is not supposed to drink wine. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, <laughs> that's a tradition. But he said, well, for this case, I'll allow myself to have one, one fingertip of wine. <laughs> so so the, the, the Archbishop Tutu actually served communion to the Dalai Lama, hmm. um, which, which I found very intriguing. Um, maybe it's just that I'm getting older and I get fed up with rules, <laughs> but, but I, I just have a hard time is saying to people, you know, if you want to come and taste the goodness of the Lord, here it is. You know, I don't care if you're inquiring. I don't care if you're an atheist. If you want to taste this, as far as I'm concerned, you can have it. Now, I may not do that as a pastor because there's rules that I'm supposed to obey. And if I know the person got baptized, I may refuse it. But if we're up to me, hey, we feed everybody. You don't refuse food. Well, to, to follow up what you're saying, Pastor uh, Joe, um, I, I, listened to that in that discourse between the two of them um, discussing the sharing of their mutuality you know things that are common in the buddhism and, and in christianity and they shared so much together and they saw some so many commonalities that i i think that has a lot to do with the fact that bishop tutu felt very comfortable because um the dalai lama showed such a strong understanding of jesus um, in the dialogue, and he felt that he would share that understanding some more with the communion. So that's how I see it linked, because I remember how they shared those common uh, understandings of their religions in that discourse. It was a very interesting thing to think, to listen to, because it was a book, but um, that was, that's, I thought of that right away when you said, gave him the, the wine. <laughs> You know, another another question about how communion you know can be properly shared um, became really important in the last two years, um, when you know most churches were were doing worship like this on 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 Zoom or or somehow you know on on Facebook and uh, virtually, and there was a big question, a big debate among Lutherans and and others uh, as to whether we could share communion like this um it was not an easy easy answer and and uh, you know our bishop zeiser he was the bishop at the time he um you know he told us please don't do that because it does not fit into our understanding of communion but if you do i'm not gonna i'm not i'm not gonna bring any you know repercussions on you <laughs> so, there were people who did it there absolutely were um yeah. Yeah. But uh, but he felt that in his role as bishop, he had to be clear that this is not yes, yes. accepted pra acceptable practice. But don't ask, don't tell, kind of thing. Um, it, it's, it's really intriguing to me that that what is seen as the church's most important means of grace has so often become a means of division. Yeah, I mean, and and. and the, the Orthodox Church, the Roman Catholic Church, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, they all say that in order to receive communion, you must be in doctrinal understanding with us, which, which just kind of blows my mind away. Is, it, is That's what it's all about. That's what love's about, that we agree on all things. I don't think so. Jesus had a bunch of really diversely believing apostles around that Last Supper. You know, they, 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 they didn't agree on anything. They were always squabbling with one another. You know, um, but, but it, it's it's... To me, it's really sad that, that what should be a unifier has become a divider. And we can see here that it it, it, it has been since the beginning um, of the yes, church, yes. unfortunately. Well, do you think that rules came about to try to 
say that communion is important it's significant it's 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 not just a frivolous thing but then we get so wrapped up in the rules that you forget you know that it is supposed to be a sign of god's love for for us so i mean personally i feel like you want to try to share communion with as many people as possible but you could see how these rules get set up to try to preserve like the importance of communion but then the rules seem to become more important than what the what the actual meaning is I think that's a really good insight. It's probably true, isn't it? Probably these rules were never intended to, to be divisive, um, but uh, but unfortunately became so, yeah. So another question I wanna ask is, um, you know, we see here in Corinth, at least prior to Paul's letters, the, the church in Corinth was dividing itself among rich and poor. You know, they, they were clearly, you know, on opposite sides of, of different tables. And I just noticing now, even the tables are different. The, the, the rich table has this nice inlay on the side and the poor table is like a, a simpler thing. But, um, but what are some ways that the church of today um, categorizes and divides ourselves? You know, how, 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 how do we do that, whether formally or informally today? Hmm. We've done it with our denominational labels. Mm. Absolutely. And we continue to do so. Every time uh, a mainline Protestant church deals with um, issues of sexuality, what usually happens is in one way or another, that church breaks into multiple pieces. Um, you know, it happened to, to the ELCA where this, uh, you know, splinter group came off. It's happening to the United Methodist Church right now. It looks like they are actually going to formally split into two separate churches. Um, the Episcopalians. <laughs> yeah. the, the Anglicans. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Broke off. So that's one. Yeah, I think one thing is, is, you know, if you feel really strongly about a particular issue like that, mm -hmm. that is enough to, to divide, you know, the church. Um, what else? Churches have often been divided racially. I mean, most churches are not exactly diverse. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, it happens socioeconomically. I mean, you do a study of churches, you'll find out most people in, in, in any given congregation fall within a certain socioeconomic uh, group. You know, um, I when I was uh, in Allentown working at St. Stephen's Lutheran Church, um, I was told that the history of St. Stephen's and Christ Lutheran Church, which was like four blocks away, and they have now merged. But uh, the, the story was that they were both started um, when, uh, you know, when, when PPL and, and a few other industries were, uh, you know, were, were moving into Allentown. Christ Lutheran Church was for the executives and St. Stephen's was for the workers. Um you know, quite explicitly in the beginning that, uh, and, and it's still, even to, to the time I was there, you know, there, there was a very different flavor among the, the, the people there. I, I used to volunteer at Eckley Miners Village up in Schuylkill County, which is kind of a, a restored old mining patch town. And the tour would begin in the Catholic church at the upper end of the town. Um, that's where all the workers went because you know, they were all the Irish, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and to be Catholic. It, the last stop on the tour was an Episcopal church down the street at the lower end of town. That's where all the executives, the big shots of the, of the coal mining operation, they went to church there because they were English and they, they were Episcopalian. So there, there you had that, that, again, a religious division, mm -hmm. uh, economic division, religious, ethnic, it, it was all there. Yeah. And I don't know that those two groups ever got together religiously. I doubt it. Well, the English and the Irish certainly wouldn't have. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think, you know, th this is not so much true as it was before, but, uh, you know, for a long time, you know, denominations were based on ethnicity. You know, if you were, if you were German, you were either Lutheran or Reformed, 
it's just what you were in, in this country. Um, if you were English, you were Episcopalian or Methodist. Um, and, That's why uh, in a small coal mining town like Minersville, you'd have 14 Roman Catholic churches. They were, they were all ethnic. Yeah, the Polish National Catholic Church, the Irish Catholic Church, the Italian, okay. yep. Well, the Polish National Catholic Church, actually, that's different from Roman Catholic, but I mean, oh, okay. you, yeah, there, there's a, but anyhow, but there'd be a Polish Roman Catholic Church, there'd be a, an Irish Roman Catholic Church. They didn't call themselves that, understand, they had saints names, but that's really what it was all about. Even the fire companies were that, they had six fire companies <laughs> in that town, and, and they, their origin was all ethnic. Mm-hmm. Which in a, which is, Corey, you, you can kind of understand when people first moved there because that's only they didn't speak English yet. They only knew their Hungarian, they only knew, knew um, German or, or whatever their, their background was. So they, they almost had to stay with their own people in a sense to get acclimated to the new country. But, but then those traditions stuck. And yeah, I noticed it, it's still here in the slate belt because when I came here. I went to the Episcopal Church, and then I went down to Easton's Church, the Episcopal Church there. And the one here was built, really, and started by the Italians. And when I walked in, I saw all these women wearing, a lot of women wearing black because they were still in mourning. And I saw St. Joseph's uh, statue with some medals on him. And, and I'm like, am I in the Catholic Church or am I in the Episcopal Church? But it was, uh, and there are two of them that were built by the people from different parts of uh, Italy. And uh, then there's the, of course, we know on Car Carmel, we know the other, the Catholic churches that were that are definitely Italian. And then you have Prince of Peace. And I don't know the other Lutheran churches, but I know there are a lot of families who come here who have been here for generations, who are from a German origin, you know, ethnicity. So, and if you look at the roles, I mean, this may be dying off a little bit, but the names are very German. Mm. And uh, so I, I, I don't know about the Methodists or anybody else, but it seems there's still a very close eth ethnic connection to the past. That the families keep coming and uh, the babies and the grandmothers and all of that except for us foreigners who come in <laughs> white mary <laughs> yeah I, th I think the uh you know the strict rules there are are certainly not there anymore there is no rule that you need to be you know pennsylvania dutch to join a lutheran church but but the reality is, um, you know, there, it's probably at least a plurality, if not a majority of the members of this church are Pennsylvania, Dutch or German in some form or another. Um, it's just, you know, and it, it'll take generations to change that unless, you know, we do yeah, some deliberate. I think it's a very natural thing that we kind of tend towards our quote own. So we have to work very hard at making sure we're reaching out beyond our own. And that's not easy to do. That's a, that's a tough one. Hmm. Not easy to do, but I, I, I think it's what, what what Paul's calling the church to do, to not just hang out with your own people. And that's that's really hard for introverts like me, especially. Yeah. <laughs> because what, I don't naturally start talking to a lot of people. That's not me. You know, I think one, one thing that happens, I think I think describing the, you know, the, the coal regions is, is a really clear analogy. Um, you know, the, 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 the coal mining industry, in, you know, in the 18th and 19th centuries, you know, really re looked a lot like the, that Pharaoh's Egypt pyramid we've, we've, we've talked about before. You had the, you know, the, the, the owners on top and then, you know, different levels of, of the workers. And to a great extent, you know, a lot of that was ethnic, you know, um, and uh, it's, it's really easy for us to, um, to, to move from, being comfortable around, you know, our, our own kind, so to speak, it's really easy to move from that to, to a hierarchy, to a Pharaoh's Egypt model. Um, and it, it's, that we still do it today. Yeah. All right, so let's, let's move on to page 68. Um, we're going to read um, just the first paragraph and that, uh, that uh, top illustration there. 
Paul was not only concerned that believers live the manna life as congregations, he was also deeply concerned that Christians throughout the ancient world live the wilderness life as a global community of faith. He feared that the partner people would practice accommodation by following the world's way of each group, culture, tribe, nation, and family, caring only about itself. Paul wanted the church throughout the world to exist as a community of communities, living together as a sign of the way God is transforming the present world into the future world, a, into the future world, a world of shalom where manna is shared by all, accommodation plus faithfulness. Uh, maybe it's not plus, just accommodation and faithfulness. Yeah. So I, I think that yeah, that ties in with what we were just talking about. Um, what are some ways you see, you know, the, the church lapsing into accommodation today? Or what are some ways that you see us, um, that you see the Holy Spirit pulling us away from that, pulling us toward faithfulness? Well, it's easy to become insulated and comfortable with your, within your own tribe. And I think sometimes that happens. We, uh, but we have to, the tension's always there to try to reach out as we have some some people have talked about you know reaching out um out of our comfortable spot with each other to make other connections outside of us and i think we are constantly working on that and it's hard it's not it's easy to be secure in our own little place but we do have some outreach going on and yeah, that's good I don't know if this really fits in with, you know, with accommodation, but I think about a lot of the things we used to do in fundraising. And when you look at, you know, it was always, you know, trying to bring people to the church and in the fundraising that we did over the years, it became part that the fundraising was part of our general operating expenses all the time instead of doing the things that brought people to the church, then to turn around and share that with in ministries that went to outreach. And I think, you know, a lot of things have changed over the years that we don't do as many of the things that we used to do, but the Holy Spirit has led us that we've been able to continue to do the outreach and that I think our members you know, have responded in amazing ways of to keep these outreach and, you know, especially, you know, with the social ministry, the connections that we've made that we maintain and keep. So I think it's really moved us away from the reliance on, you know, on that, on that portion of it. I don't know if that's, but I just feel that's a good thing. Yeah. I think when we when we talk about um, when, 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 when we bring up the question, well, how can we bring people into the church? Which is a good question, but I think there's always a, a tension there between accommodation and faithfulness because I think within that question you can go a couple of different ways, and I think we're always um, we're always tempted to, to to answer that question and well, what can we do that would get people to want to come here? What can we do to entertain people? What can we do to, um, you know, to make it more attractive? And I'm not sure that's the faithful thing. I think, um, or at least it, it can sometimes not be. You know, if if we're if we're providing, you know, 
whatever for for people's convenience and and to make people feel good and 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 uh, uh, you know that sort of thing, then then maybe we're not doing what what we're called to do. Um, so the question then is, well, how can we be faithful at what we're doing and at the same time, um, you know, encourage people to come? And it, it's um, I'm talking in circles here because it's a hard question. It's very hard to know where those lines are there. I like providing a service through our congregation. When the daycare was there, there was a lot of new people that were coming in to the, through those doors, bringing their children to daycare. And that guy gave the people that were there an opportunity to meet those people that were bringing their children. And we had the Sunday school facilities there that those people enrolled their children at some point into our Sunday school. And that we then got to know the parents a little more because they were bringing their children there. So maybe through some service. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was fun meeting me. Uh, I was the parish secretary there at the time when we had the daycare. So I got the opportunity to learn a lot of the names of the children as they went past my office, yeah. you know, and that kind of stuff. Was it every day? It was uh, daily daycare? Yes. Yeah, it's the same and, one that's now down the road at, uh, at the corner, yeah. right? And from what I've heard, you know, there were, there were some problems with it. There were some problems exactly. of... Um, of, you know, there were some territorial questions of, you know, is this the daycare's room or is this the Sunday school's room? And, and I, you know, um, and that slips into this, you know, accommodation that, that we, we care about our own more than we care about, about others. And it, it's, um, it, it, it's and hard. It's, it's hard. It had good things and it had not so good things. But it did bring people there. Yeah. One thing I see as a as a sign of of um, of good things is um, I am seeing signs of congregations working together um, more than than I've seen ever before. Um, our I, I, this is a secret. Our council is inviting the councils of Trinity and Stone Church to come to a meeting, and it's not because we want to start talking about you know sharing a pastor or anything like that. It's because we want to talk about let's get to know each other. How can we, you know, how can we partner with one another here? You know, how can we, um, you know, what, 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 what do you do that we can help you do? And what do we do that you can help us do? Or what can we start doing together? And I think it wasn't so long ago that we viewed other congregations as rivals as, well, we don't want to, we don't want to do anything together because what if they steal our members? Um, and, and I think we're, we're starting to view it a little bit differently than that, um, which I think is a, a really good, good move we're making, even if it's, even if part of the, uh, you know, motivation behind it is, you know, is, is from desperation. It's, um, it's a good thing. It's an excellent yeah. idea. And excellent. there's, and nobody's talking about merging. Don't let anything like that. You know, it's, it's, it's honestly just to talk about how can we just do things together? Um, right. Excellent. Yeah. All right. So, um, so we're going to read about. Um, I, I think we're going to we're going to close now. But but what we'll we'll start with next time is um, is a, a big test of of the of whether the church was was going to be faithful or accommodating, um, and we'll uh, we'll look at that next time. So. Any last um, comments, questions, thoughts before we wrap up? I just want to say, say quick that people do read the sign out front. I, yesterday, I happened to meet one of the guys who's in charge of, of Lake Mincy, who has, plays a role in conservation in Northampton County. And I happened to mention that my son was the pastor of Prince of Peace down the road. He said, oh, they're celebrating their 50th anniversary. And I'm sure the only way he knew that was because of signs out there. I don't know how else he would have oh. known 
Because yeah. <laughs> he gave no indication to me that he's church in, in any way. So I just, just to know, people read the sign. That's all. <laughs> that's a beautiful sign, isn't it? They, 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 yeah. They, they did a nice. great job putting that Very together. Nice. Um, I want to know who put the message on there that said it was too cold to go out and change the sign. <laughs> when, like that was from back in the winter time. I, think I, I have no idea. <laughs> hey, Pastor. I certainly uh, wasn't going to ask anybody else to do that. So no, I mean, I, what, it, yeah. what it said was, 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 um, what did it say? I, I I know I blamed it on my son. It was something like the pastor told me to change the sign, but it's too cold or something like that. So uh, I, yeah. I, um, I want to share something really cute that happens on uh, election day at the polls. It was kind of slow and there was just one woman in the voting booth. And um, we, we were before she had come in, we were talking about um, the beautification of Johnsonville with the uh, renovation of the hotel and the houses across from it. And uh, yeah. Ruth Beisha's old house, how the same owners fixed that house and how beautiful it was. And the lady comes out of the voting booth. She's full of pride. And she's going, you don't know how happy you ladies make me because I'm the owner of all of that. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> behind the curtain. But by the grace of God. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Be careful what you say. You don't know who's yes. listening to yeah. you. Yeah. That right. all very <laughs> both, both she yeah. and you are very, very lucky that you were saying good things. <laughs> when she left, I said, but by the grace of God. That's neat. Oh, That's yeah. neat. You made, you made somebody happy. You made, you made somebody's day. Yeah. yeah, she really was very yeah. proud and yeah. very happy to hear all those things. Yeah. And Did we're you invite her? doing it. I mean, it's it's just beautiful. It is. Doing. Did, did you invite her to come to our church? <laughs> Knowing yeah, you. I, I did, but I, but I did speak to another woman who said she wanted to join. I gave Pastor her phone number, her name, uh -huh. and... Um, the hotel, she was telling me, she wants to put up a few rooms to make it like a motel there also. But the township is giving her a really hard time with mm. the permits and all. Yeah. Um, mm. so who knows, Johnsonville might get on that map, uh, <laughs> you know, before we know it. <laughs> mm. Uh, be traffic jams and uh, yeah, yeah. Tra yeah. 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 Light, light down there and yeah, yeah. light, <laughs> light up there. <laughs> downtown center city Johnsonville. Anything else? The funny before? thing is, she's buy she seems to be buying the property from the intersection towards the farm, you know, the Johnsonville farm market and the Haddad's of trying to buy it up from there <laughs> <laughs> so there's a competition going on <laughs> all right then we'll see you all next time okay yeah, have, have a good day everybody, everybody. Bye, -bye. Bye. Bye. bye bye have a cool this weekend <laughs>